Right, hi everybody. Let me know if you can hear me. It's just past 4.30 according to my um, computer clock. So, um, I'm assuming, Isabel, that Samuel's on his way. Is that correct? He's loading up. Okay. But he can hear me, I think. And um, just not sure. Is Alyssa here? No, Alyssa's not here. Let me just see if I've had a message. No, I don't see that Alyssa has written me a message. So, um, let's see if Michael and Alyssa and Hannah turn up as we go along. So, oh, we're on week 20, Wuthering Heights. There should be a number one after Wuthering Heights. There's Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Let me know if you can hear me. Okay, so we just started Wuthering Heights, week one. Uh, the um, This day in history is this one. On this day in 1918, the last specimen of the indigenous parakeet in North America, called the Carolina parakeet, died in captivity. A combination of felling old forests for western expansion and hunting them for their plumage and disease led to the extinction of the species. So on this day in 1918, the last one died. And then there were no more indigenous North American parakeets. Do you have a favorite endangered animal? And have you done anything to help preserve it? So Eden is shouting, panda, 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 panda. Must be her favorite endangered animal. And what is Eden doing to help preserve it? That is the question. Uh, Emily, Emily's favorite endangered animal are the white tigers whose names she forgot. <laughs> the Siberian tigers. All right. So Eden, it's her favorite endangered animal since yesterday. Evan says, bald eagle or golden eagle haven't done anything directly to help it, though. So I asked this question kind of to prod you all. If you have a favorite endangered animal and you haven't done anything to help preserve it, think about what you might be able to do to help preserve it. So Rebecca says the same, although I don't know what she means by same. I don't know if bald eagle and golden eagle are what she means the same, or if it's Emily's white tigers. Pandas are her new favorite animals, says Eden. Rebecca's, oh, Siberian tigers, okay. Linus says tuna and various whales. Lauren, I wondered if Lauren was going to say this. English toy terrier, we have one, and we're going to help the, the vulnerable breed by when she's about three years old, breeding her. And we're also going to be going to Crufts this year, not to show because our dog's too young, but we're going to be on the Discovering Dogs stand for the English Toy Terrier and talk to them about this wonderful historical breed that is dying out. Lauren says, Linus, is tuna endangered? Isabel likes the beluga whale. Alyssa likes a lot of endangered animals. She doesn't have a favorite. Emily says her fave animal is a monkey. Overfishing. The crested gecko used to be her favorite endangered animal. Well, I think, uh, well, we'll have to think about that then, Lauren, if you can have tuna fish sandwiches anymore. <laughs> Maybe there's a difference between line caught and net fished. I don't know. So any of you um, ever join Worldwide Fund for Nature? That's one way you could help your endangered animal. Um, there are other um, charities like Flora and Fauna International that save endangered animals and endangered plants. They rescued a bat in Madagascar, I think it was. Ooh, Samuel says dwarf lantern shark. So there are ways, um, 
was it Greenpeace was sending out a petition recently well last year for some I think there were some special dolphins that lived only in the um, Gulf at Baja California and they were trying to protect their grounds so that they didn't die out So people have obviously lost interest, so I'll change the change to the next slide, Ben. Number four, look at class time agenda. It's time to focus. We're not going to talk anymore about tuna fish or pandas or sharks or anything. We're just going to focus now. We're going to focus on Wuthering Heights. <clears throat> Friendly rule review, everybody is very aware of that, so we'll skip that techie time. Techie time is the time when you need to focus because I usually say important things like, for example, add on book club is meeting next Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. That's 11 to noon Central Standard Time, uh, slightly later than we have in the past. Hopefully Lauren will be back in time from her art class. I do need five questions to that are relevant to the rivals, please, by then because that's the play we're reading right now. This play has the character in it called Miss Malaprop who um, is the reason, I believe, the reason that we call it a malapropism. A glance back at Frankenstein. So earlier today, Isabel and Gabriel and Samuel were over at my house. They usually come over to my house on a Thursday. We do Bible study and art together. And Isabel's mom, Maggie, and I were talking over our coffee about Frankenstein. So we're just glancing back at Frankenstein. We were thinking about the fate of the creature, about how he would never have been able to see redemption or have a kernel of goodness within him because he had no, whether, whether you believe this or not, this would have been Shelley's belief, I would think at the time, that he had, that the creature had no soul because he had no spark of God's life within him, having not been conceived naturally. So then we thought of a really good picture about this, and we thought it might help you to think a bit deeper about the implications of the creature. Are we focused now, people? Looks like we're not, really. Well, Eden, I think he never, ever could have been good. I think that's right. Because of their, um, their belief about how humans were made. And many religious people continue to have this belief today that at conception there is a spark of life that is supernatural and related to God. So this is the picture. Okay, why do you think he appeared to be good at first? Anyone want to answer? Because it made him feel good. Because <laughs> he was helpless. It's a very romantic idea. Wordsworth did it all the time. Remember, the closer you were to birth, the more innocent you were. But you were doomed to spiral down into human selfishness. He had no reason to be bad. Give him time. He was helpless and innocent. Did he have a conscience? <clears throat> I don't know the answer to this. Also, remember, we only have the creature's word for it, don't we? Creature's telling his own story. <laughs> so consider the source. Yeah, no soul. That's the that's the kind. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Doctor Pete doesn't know. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking about this. Anyway, you want to see my picture? You'll see my picture. Here's my picture. <laughs> he would be like Darth Vader, but not having Anakin inside him. Anakin was a man who could be redeemed. But he's like Darth Vader without the foundation of Anakin within. I kind of thought that's what he was like. Love me, Daddy. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. That's just a bit silly. 
Syllabus slot. So this week you read chapters 1 to 8. Notice next week it's only chapter 9 to 12. It's not quite so many chapters, but that must mean they're longer because I always make you read about 60 pages. Um, you're reading this week about Sir Walter Scott Part 2. Very relevant to be reading about Sir Walter Scott while we're reading Emily Bronte because Emily Bronte was very much influenced by Sir Walter Scott. And this week now we're going to pick up the beginning of chapter 9 to the part in the middle of it called Finding the Key Sentences from Adler. Uh, Linus, I welcome you to make such a film. I would love to see it. <laughs> Talk about what you read. So we come to the portion of the webinar where I turn my microphone off. I let you guys have five minutes of uninterrupted text chat about the book you read this week. You can always bring up your own topics, but here are some ideas to get you started. How have you managed to keep straight all the people in the story so far? How does this story compare with Frankenstein? That's the book. Can you see romantic elements in this book? What impression do you have of the characters and what makes it so atmospheric? So I'm letting you guys, uh, turning it loose over to you.
Now, get up. I'm teaching a class online. You're too noisy. Sorry if you guys got to hear that. Little neighbor kids showed up to play. And they were standing right outside my door. All right. So, um... Uh, Alyssa's uh, comparison juices are really going, getting all those um, books like Lorna Doone and um, King's General and stuff, thinking about those, made me remember, ah, lovely times in Renaissance Lit, that extra um, book club last year, really great list of books we read. So um, anyway, my short presentation today, I'm going to talk to you about some historical background of the book. So Emily Bronte was born in July 30th, 1818, um, which is roughly about the time Ivanhoe was print published, if any of you have read Ivanhoe. And she died December the 19th, 1848, so she was just 30, a little over 30. If you had bought the original novel in 1847, you would have purchased it as a three-volume set, two volumes of which were Wuthering Heights, and the third one was Agnes Grey. The authors were purported to be Ellis Bell and Acton Bell. So the Bronte sisters wrote under pen names for many years to hide their identities and perhaps to free them to write as the muse took them so they wouldn't be embarrassed. The fact that people think, oh, a woman wrote this. How embarrassing. Women shouldn't write like this. They weren't properly identified by their real names until the edition in 1850. So here you see it says Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey by Ellis and Acton Bell. And it, you look a little bit lower, it says uh, the, a preface by Currer Bell, and that was Charlotte Bronte. So um, Emily wrote Wuthering Heights, and Anne wrote Agnes Grey, and then of course Charlotte wrote um, Jane Eyre. Ellis is Emily, yeah. I'm just pausing because I might be sneezing again soon. Yes, yeah, so um, when they first wrote it, they wrote under pen names. Very little is known about Emily Bronte. She left behind her. She left behind her only a few bits of paper. There are two di diary entries and two letters and some birthday papers, which were commentaries that the sisters wrote about each other on their birthdays. So uh, she probably wrote birthday papers about Anne, you see. On Anne's birthday, she would write about Anne. And Anne wrote about her. The text of these letters can be found here. So of her two diary entries and her two letters and her birthday papers, the um, complete text of them are at this link. Charlotte Bronte, who um, lived the longest of all of them, claimed that her main character in her novel, Shirley, was based on Emily. And she wrote quite a bit a about Emily after Emily died, particularly about how loving and motherly she'd been. She was like a mother to Anne because their mom died young. And she was very private. However, this note here says Charlotte wasn't always consistent about her description of Emily, but Emily does seem to have been a very sensitive and quiet person. Come on, concentrate, please. Let's not talk about your own pen names. You can do that on the discussion forum. The short version of Emily's life is this. All of her siblings, no, of all of her siblings, oh, hold on, short version of Emily's life and indeed all, uh, and that of all of her siblings, hope that makes sense, was that she and they lived most of their rural life in Yorkshire. M sorry, they lived most of their lives in rural Yorkshire. She was the fifth of six children born to Reverend Patrick Bronte and his wife Maria Branwell Bronte. Her father, that's Patrick, was originally named Brunty, not Bronte, Brunty, and he came from Northern Ireland. He was an ordained vicar in the Church of England and they eventually settled in Haworth in Yorkshire. He met his wife Maria when she moved from Cornwall to live with her aunt in Yorkshire to help her aunt run the household of a Methodist training school. So Maria was of a Methodist family. And that, she was 29 years old when she did that. Both of her parents had just died. 
By the next year, she and Patrick were already married, and she had her first child named Maria at the age of 30. Now, already can you see that it wasn't unusual to name the mom and the daughter the same. So when you get Catherine and Kathy in Wuthering Heights, it isn't that Emily's just trying to confuse us. It was very typical to do that. And in fact, it probably would help us remember, if we were from that time period, that Kathy was the daughter of Catherine. Even more than that, you'll see in just a moment that Emily's brother was called Branwell. So you see you've got Maria Branwell Bronte. Obviously Branwell was her maiden name. They used that to make his first name. And that also happens in Wuthering Heights with Linton getting named uh, after his mother's maiden name. So Maria went on to have five more children in rapid succession. So first she had Maria, and then about a year later she had Elizabeth, then she had Charlotte, then she had Patrick Branwell, whom they just called Branwell, then she had Emily, Emily Jane, and then Anne. So she had them very quickly after each other, and about a year later she died of ovarian cancer. Meanwhile, her sister had come to live with them to help Patrick run the household and look after the children. It's interesting to note that these rapid births suggest that she employed wet nurses to nurse her children rather than feed them, them herself. This meant that a local woman was hired to breastfeed the children, or the child, and it was considered a very respectable and a rather lucrative profession for quite poor people. Nursemaids often made more money than their laboring husbands did. This is only supposition, of course. But all the Bronte sisters' books include nursemaid characters, and it was a wide, widely practiced in Victorian times. As an aside, Wuthering Heights includes nursemaids in the form of Nellie and her mother. Nursemaids were often single women with an illegitimate child. If you remember, Nellie's mother was Hendley's nursemaid. There was no mention of a husband, so it's possible that Nellie was an illegitimate child. The other clue about using nursemaids was how rapidly Emily's mother was producing babies. You see, it's generally the case that ovulation is delayed by naturally feeding one's baby. On average, that's about 14 months, and that usually will then space children out by about two years. Women who used nursemaids, however, didn't have this delay, and so their bodies were never able to really recover from pregnancy and birth, and that made them quite weakly and sickly. One of the reasons that middle-class women and upper-class women actually died quite frequently um, because they just had so many children so close together. <clears throat> There's another side effect of using nursemaids, and that is that babies don't receive the colostrum that's produced in mother's milk within a few days of giving birth. Sure, the babies are still fed with human milk, but they miss out on the, on the disease-fighting antibodies that come from the colostrum from their mother. Though diseases were prevalent in this era for a number of reasons, failing to, give, failing to get vital antibodies at birth would not have helped. So that's another downside of using nursemaids, is that your children didn't get these disease-fighting antibodies. Typical illnesses of the time were typhus, cholera, smallpox, gout, rickets, and of course tuberculosis. The biggest cause wasn't necessarily bad hygiene or bad diet, but a fundamental misunderstanding of how diseases were transmitted. People believed at the time that diseases were inherited. So if you had a sickly, weak parent, you had inherited the propensity to be ill. They also believed that you could get ill by breathing bad air, by getting your feet wet. If you had a violent temper, if you experienced rapid changes in temperature, or if you ate cold fruits like cucumber and melons, Emily's death, for example, was attributed to getting cold at Branwell's funeral and then pining for her brother, rather than to the tuberculosis that had been rife in their family for so many years. <clears throat> now, being off base about the causes of disease was only one and only the first of many of their problems. Next came the remedies that they would try to use to fight these diseases. It was common for them to do bloodletting. 
where you actually cut somebody and gathered the blood in a pot as though you could drain the disease away. They would use leeches to suck out blood, calling it the bad blood. They're going to suck out the bad blood. Or people would move or take trips to places with, quote, better air. Or they would apply poultices made of mercury, the fumes of which were obviously deadly. Or they would use enemas and emetics to get the bad stuff to exit the body through the bottom or the top. So they would try to make them throw up or go poo, again trying to get the bad stuff out of them. All of these things would at the very least weaken a body, but at the worst poison it further. Mercury, arsenic, iodine, excess alcohol, these were all used as purges and poultices and purifiers. Is it any wonder that Emily refused medical treatment from a doctor when she fell gravely ill? In fact, I believe Charles II and George Washington both died of mercury poisoning when people were trying to help them fight off an illness. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about tuberculosis, also known as consumption. It was called this because the infected person wastes away for a long period of time before the terminal symptoms like coughing up blood appear. It was particularly misunderstood. No one realized that it was highly contagious, that hygiene and isolation could play its part, and that people could harbor it for many years before the outward signs were seen. Apparently also, which I didn't write down, it was very common to do a lot of spitting in Victorian times, and that spit would be contagious. So people going around with tuberculosis spitting on the ground were not helping things. In fact, though, there were two kinds of tuberculosis. There was the lung kind, called pulmonary tuberculosis, the kind that Emily had, and as an aside, Doc Holliday and John Keats, they both had this as well. And then there's the bone kind, of which George Eliot's son died. The lung kind was this airborne kind and the one that goes in the spit, but the bone kind was introduced to the body via bad milk. It was the bovine tuberculosis and people were drinking the milk from infected cows not realizing that it was full of tuberculosis and um, killing the children who they were giving the milk to. And um, also I haven't said it here, but we watched a program, Lauren and I did, and um, I've got the link of it on the next slide. We watched a program about milk, and the thing was, they worked out how to um, how to add a, a chemical to the milk so it didn't smell um, sour or taste sour anymore. But that, uh, but you know, the reason the milk was sour was because it was off. But they could hide the fact that it was off by putting this chemical in it. And then people would still drink it, even though it was uh, rancid and off milk. And so that didn't help either. <clears throat> anyway, if the subject of disease and dangers of Victorian times has interested you, then I highly recommend a program called Hidden Killers. I think it's called Hidden Killers in the Home Victorian Era, actually. And it's two sister programs about the Tudor period and the Edwardian era. Here is a link to the one about the Victorian era, and this is the one that covers the topic of bone-based tuberculosis from bad milk. It also talks about um, dangerous staircases. It talks about um, bathrooms that blew up and um, putting things like plaster of Paris into bread. It's a very interesting article, uh, video. So why is there so much interest in this morbid subject, perhaps for me? Now, if you know me very well, you know that I have an interest in things like disease and jail and death, <laughs> anyway, in literature. But why so much interest in the morbid subject for Emily's book? Sure, Emily died of it herself. Sure, so did her two older sisters when they were all sent to boarding school when Emily was only six. 
and so did Anne. And so did her brother Branwell, though he might have died because of drinking too much and taking too many drugs, rather than necessarily from the consumption. But the reason is, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up, is because these ideas like good air and bad air make their appearance in the novel. We've got Nellie's position as the wet nurse to Harriton, that's there, as is illness in general. Did you know that the body count for this book is 12? 12 people die in this book. 12 out of 18 people, and no one's murdered. So sickness and disease is something that is very much a part of this book. And those of you who are doing add-on comp, think about the atmosphere created when everyone seems to be dropping dead for various reasons. Quite unlike Frankenstein. Well, people died in Frankenstein, but they were murdered. <laughs> I know! Can you believe there's only 18 characters? Don't you feel like there's about 800? Now, the author's own family suffered a body count of 7 out of 8 who died before the age of 40. Charlotte was the longest lived of the family other than her dad. She died at the age of 38 from severe morning sickness. She was pregnant with her first child. Perhaps also she'd contracted typhus from an elderly family servant who perished shortly before she did. But nevertheless, she lived the longest, but all of them were dead except for the dad before the age of 40. Her dad was over 80 when he died. They were a very sickly family. It might be, I'm just guessing here, but it might be that when those two sisters died of tuberculosis that they picked up from the school, the rest of them were also infected and it just kind of lay dormant in them for a long time. But out of the six children, five died of tuberculosis. How do you die from morning sickness? She couldn't eat any food and she got dehydrated and very weak. In fact, I won't say anything. Yeah, she she had a it was a very horrible death actually. So while we're talking about historical context, let's move from the discussion about death and disease to one about Heathcliff's origins. No doubt you've picked up some basic details about him. He was an orphan whom Mr. Earnshaw brought home and adopted, even fawned over, but whom everyone else disliked because he was dark, dirty, and spoke gibberish. He was wild, and he was very much other. So this is some of the things that Nellie tells you at the beginning of her story about this family. Yes, he did like him better than his own children. Racism? Possibly. Very interesting, though. Why would Mr. Earnshaw, this is Catherine's dad, why would he walk 120 miles to Liverpool? Why would he bring home an orphan child whom quickly he began to favor? There is some thought that perhaps Heathcliff was Earnshaw's illegitimate son. We will never know, but there is circumstantial evidence that suggests it. That just seems too weird. It would also be why his wife really didn't like Heathcliff. But we don't know. This is just a guess. It just seems very strange that Mr. Earnshaw would walk 120 miles to Liverpool and bring this child home. The next is the description that Heathcliff is dark. Does that simply mean that he's dark-headed and swarthy, like olive-complexioned, or does it mean that he's actually black-skinned? Again, the suggestion is that Heathcliff is indeed very dark, as in black-skinned. Nellie at one point thinks he's from China or India. Actually, she says your mother's from China and your dad's from India. Um, or she says something like, I wouldn't be surprised if your mother's from China and your dad's from India. And others equate his complexion to that of the devil. 
Either way, again, Heathcliff is very much an outsider, even from the beginning and even from the way that he looks. He looks very different from everybody else. So there's also, they refer to him as a gypsy. And several times they call him a gypsy. Gypsies were nomadic peoples who originally came from India, although now we think of the Moors coming from the from Romanian area, but that's because they moved into that area um, first. So they moved throughout Eastern Europe during the Middle Ages, and then at times, such as 1400 to 1600 in England, they were banned, they were deported, they were executed. They were called gypsies because it was thought that they came from Egypt. Perhaps with England as a portal to the New World in this time that, um, in sort of the 1800s, a, po uh, a promise of a new start, maybe that's why gypsies were starting to pass through England again in order to make their way abroad. Notice Mr. Earnshaw went to Liverpool for this boy, and Liverpool is a port town. Gypsies were held with suspicion because of their nomadic lifestyle, their quality of being other, and, and obviously they had a bad reputation. Because they were quite nomadic peoples, they had a reputation of sort of not setting down roots but also helping themselves to other people's property. They were also um, used in literature a lot. Because of this ability to move amongst the classes, they were able to overturn the usual mores of culture. They did not fit in to the normal social structure. Much like Shakespeare might use Italy as a backdrop for a play because of its cosmopolitan and sometimes sordid lifestyle, gypsies were used as this kind of outside-the-box culture. So what about his name? We're told that Heathcliff is named after Earnshaw's son who died in childbirth. It's possible that Emily was inspired by Thorncliff, who's a character in Sir Walter Scott's Rob Roy, as she was similarly inspired to name other characters after friends of the family or old servants. These names like um, Hareton and Hindley, there were people whose names are similar to that that um, she grew up with. Nevertheless, it was also a common stereotype that gypsies had wild-sounding, nature type names, I suppose a bit like the stereotype of American Indian names. And certainly Heathcliff relates to wild heatherland and steep precipices. So keep an eye out for these things as you read along. A. Looking at illness. Who gets ill? B. The nature or natural uh, characters versus sort of the tame characters. Maybe the wild versus tame would be a better thing to say. C, the two houses, the Grange and um, Wuthering Heights, and what happens in them. And also keep an eye out for the atmosphere of a setting that is um, in the Yorkshire Moors. And with a name like Wuthering Heights, with weathering being the sound that wind makes um, as it whips around the moors and then throughout the house a bit like a ghostly sound. Um, adds to the atmosphere of the book. Okay, <clears throat> so normally I would do narrations now, but as I explain in this next slide, Lisa's on holiday and normally she compiles them all for me and sends them to me as a, as a um, slideshow, which I just pop in here. But she hasn't done it this week, and I didn't have time to do it, which is why I have a TA. So I will have to do it over the weekend and send you all a message about who's got which awards. Yeah, we're going to be early today. Yay! Meanwhile, I have done Blue Ribbon and Fun Activity. Um, despite numerous new paintings of Emily Bronte having emerged in auction houses in the past decade, there are only two depictions of her that are known to be authentic. Who painted them and where can we find them today? 
and then the fun activity was to make a family tree of the characters in Heathcliff's household at the beginning of the book. Include dead people so it makes sense, and you'll be glad you've done this activity. So Linus was the first to answer the blue ribbon challenge. I don't know why my blue ribbon picture hasn't shown up, but there you go. The only authentic portraits of Emily Bronte were done by her brother Branwell. Both of them called the called well he calls it the profile portrait but it's a fragment of the now lost gun group family portrait and then the pillar portrait are on display at the national portrait gallery in london and linus oh no hold on linus let's see i don't sometimes i don't understand why it does this can i get it any time quickly because it's really good. Anyway, Linus has done a picture. And I'm just going to fetch it. I have no idea why they didn't show up on the slideshow. Hopefully this will work. That didn't work. <laughs> it will, just a minute. Copy image. Maybe you'll have to put it in. <laughs> there we go. I got several copies. So there is um, the, the um, family tree. The only thing that um, Linus missed out, and it's, oh goodness, now I have about seven copies in there. The only thing that's missed out there really is Isabel, who is Edgar's sister, and uh, Linton's mom. <laughs> Can you not see it? Well, wait a mo. It will turn up. Tell me when you can see it. Ah, uh, yeah. It's a uh, very. Everyone suddenly got all kinds of red on their slideshow, so that would be why. Now just wait a moment. It's because I tried to copy in about six. And it freaked it out. Okay. The other thing I can do maybe, I don't know if this will work, is give you the link. So anyway, I, I still encourage you all to do this for yourself because I'm sure Linus will tell you it's helped him a lot understand what's going on in the story. And it will help you get the Catherines and the Cathys and all the different Heathcliffs and the different Lintons and everybody sorted out. Okay, so the last thing to say is I'm reading chapter 9 to 12 of Wuthering Heights, the second part of Sir Walter Scott and Marshall, and a bit of chapter 9 of Adler. Remember that your narrations are due on Tuesday, discussion questions on Wednesday. You're invited to stay online. We'll go ahead and finish at 5.30 or half past the hour for everybody today, but you can all stay on and chat. Hopefully those of you who normally dash off We'll spend some time and chat with people instead. Can I just ask that people not go leaping into good-looking bad guy forum? Because I imagine for a lot of people who don't do that, it's a bit boring. So try to do something with a bit more creativity and uh, inclusiveness during this chat time. 
I'm going to turn off my chat and let you guys um, spend your time until half past. So I will see you all next week and enjoy the book. Bye.